Two little mice fell into a bucket of cream. The first mouse quickly gave up and drowned, but the second mouse, he struggled so hard that he eventually churned that cream into butter. And he walked out. Amen. Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. What's up, fam squad? I've got some pretty exciting news. If you listen to the podcast much, you know we've been building a pretty vibrant community of truly, truly extraordinary people who have committed to an unconventional route through life. The Successful Dropout audience has been growing a lot, and I get a lot of people reaching out to me now with all sorts of questions regarding education, dropping out, opting out, entrepreneurship, resources, networking, etc. So much so that I decided it was time to create a more accessible community on Facebook so that we can all ask and answer these kinds of questions together, as well as celebrate our successes and encourage each other during um, inevitable adversity. So I've created a closed Facebook group, and I want to invite you to join it. If you follow Successful Dropout, if you resonate with our philosophy and want to help me grow this thriving community, go to SuccessfulDropout.com forward slash group. This community is for the rebels, the outliers, the innovators, the doers, and those who dare to dream and act on their dreams. If you're a dropout, an opt-out, if you're thinking about doing one of those things, if you're a parent, even if you aren't any of those things and you graduated school, I want to invite you to join. All that matters is that you resonate with the successful dropout philosophy and that you enter the group with the intention to provide value to the other members and not just receive value yourself. Again, go to SuccessfulDropout.com forward slash group to request admission. Once you're a part of the group, introduce yourself and get involved and I'll see you there. What is up, Successful Dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have Micah Green. Finally, (laughs) Uh, Micah dropped out of Cornell University to found Madebot, a company on a mission to bring Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons to reality, Uh, starting with the world's first housekeeping robot for hotels. Madebot is starting to attract some major customers such as the Marriott and the Hilton, and just finished his first round of funding. And the reason I said finally at the beginning of this is because Micah and I have been trying to get this interview done for, well, several months. Um, We've been on Skype once or twice before, and then something technologically wasn't going our way, so we've had to postpone it. And then I think besides that, it's been like six or seven other times we've, we've like set an appointment and then had to move it. So Micah, it's great to finally get you on the show, man. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Yeah, totally. And thanks so much for having me. Excited that we finally got past all the video conference. But, uh, <laughs> I don't want this to happen. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you nailed it on the head. I mean, really, we're working on bringing uh, the first housekeeping robot to hotels. So that's our first step towards Rosie the Robot. Um, and just backing up a little bit, I actually worked as a housekeeper. So um, I was working in the mm-hmm. hotels, making beds, cleaning the rooms, and was just blown away. This was actually part of one of my classes at the hotel school in Cornell. And um, it just felt completely broken to me. So I was really intrigued, kept working as one, kept taking notes and really landed on uh, creating Rosie, which could focus on cleaning floors, as well as bringing a lot of data and analytics to management um, in a space that's really been untouched for hundreds of years. So, so yeah, that's what we're working on today. Yeah, and and personally, I find this pretty fascinating because there's a, a a member of my immediate family who is actually there. We're uh, we're all kind of involved in real estate, and and he's building a uh, basically building a Marriott right now. So we're just starting to get in this kind of hotel space and learn about kind of what it takes. So this is interesting. But um, the Jetsons, man, I remember watching the Jetsons when I was a kid, even though that TV show is kind of before my time, even when I was little, but I I imagine you must be, be familiar with the show, huh? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was definitely like more of the reruns (laughs) when I was growing up. Right. It was amazing. And um, (laughs) that combined with just like playing with robot kits and toys, it's just, 
it came to life to me. Like it, it's real. It's here today. And I think a lot of people think it's, you know, way out in the future. So, um, so the Jetsons helped kind of bring some of this forward a little bit, I think, and inspire some more people uh, to get into it early on. Yeah, I, I like that. When you put it, when you say it, you know, relate it to the that TV show, it immediately kind of puts a, a cool vision in my mind. I think that's good for, it's probably a good approach to some branding or marketing you figured out there. But then the other thing too, do you watch uh, The Office at all? Oh yeah, absolutely love it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because it's just Cornell, like Andy and, and Cornell, like, oh man, it just cracks me up. Yeah. <laughs> and that one episode where uh, Dwight dresses off in the Cornell gear and you know, just screws with Andy. It's pretty great, too. <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> oh, man. Well, it's sweet, man. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's start. Um, tell us the story of of dropping out of Cornell, I guess, because here you're in this really prestigious university, um, and you drop out to to start working with a, a, a robot, essentially. So, ha, you know, what, what's that story there, and, and what were the events that kind of led up to making that decision? Yeah, for sure. So um, definitely an interesting uh, debate with my parents, but backing up a little bit. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was growing up uh, with in an entrepreneurial family. So my dad was more on the health side. He was curing cancer, essentially, while my mom had built her own companies and, and kind of got it from her parents who started their own summer camp and whatnot. So I was really exposed at a young age and loved this idea of creating something from nothing, like really coming up with an idea, building it out from scratch, having the freedom to go in any direction you want and then executing on that. So that was just so exciting and so cool. So I'd been building companies from a really young age when I was seven years old. I was selling junk out of my basement for you know, making a few dollars a week. Uh, but I used the cuteness factor to my advantage. Uh, eventually yep. got into more serious businesses with like video editing and uh, and eventually like smartphone app. So actually the uh, most recent business I was working on is an app called Shark Puncher, um, where you essentially race against your friends virtually on your mobile you know, device. It's an app. And um, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. And it was really interactive. It was multiplayer. You, you race to punch sharks? Yeah, it was uh, very different. You ride a dolphin. You're a cowboy. You ride a dolphin, and you're going through the ocean punching sharks. Uh, um, <laughs> that sounds amazing. Can I still download it? You can if you have an iPhone. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway. Do, was there any like real-life experience that like had you create something like that? <laughs> yeah, looking back, I don't know what I, <laughs> what I was on exactly, but... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it was, it kind of just came out of the blue, believe it or not. So, um, I think I was talking, oh, it was, I was talking with a, a, um, with some friends about this cool story of like a surfer who, uh, literally was like riding and there's like a shark following him and he just socked him in the face. Like as he was riding along, saved his life and a few others, like it was kind of nuts. And I think that evolved into a game version, but, uh, but yeah, it was just oh, something out amazing. there, something fun, something different. Um, that was just really cool. And, and this was when this is back, um, you know, about like four or five years ago now. Um, and when when a lot of these games like Angry Birds, when the big ones are out there. So it's just a really cool space that had developed and um, I thought had you know huge potential and was just fun. So I was working on that throughout high school and, and actually college to the first year in freshman year, um, at least the first semester. And then finally, I got to this point. Um, where I was working as the room attendant and came up with the idea of like bringing robots to hotels. And it was just so cool. And I built robots both at like a competitive level and just for fun on the side, but um, never really like, you know, brought it out to the real world in, in terms of like actual use cases. And um, I always looked at the space as being untapped because robots are in these assembly lines and um, all these warehouses. But what about the rest of the world? What about the spaces where humans interact with each other? And, where there's a lot of you know actual uh, interaction involved there, so so that's where it became super cool to think about this idea of bringing robots outside of assembly lines and into service industry and, and people facing industries like hotels and hospitality and um, and I kind of got into this dilemma where I was really anxious of like what am I doing with my life? I'm sure yeah, I was just freshman year, but. Um, but I really wanted to know, like, what was I passionate about? What did I really care about? What did I want to put everything into? And um, I went to a professor who then led me to her best friend, um, who is a serial entrepreneur, started and sold a few companies for lots and lots, like hundreds of millions um, 
in the hardware space. And she had the background in computers, not robotics, but you know, essentially very similar components. And I went to her apartment one day and just sat down and said, look, I love Shark Puncher. It's a lot of fun. But now I have this other concept and I'm just not sure how to you know, distribute my time. I'm a full-time student. I don't know what I should be working on. I put so much time and money of my own money into Shark Puncher and uh, all this effort, sweat, you know, sleepless nights. And here I am like trying to figure out what to do. And, and she ultimately like gauged and asked me a few questions to poke around and uh, ultimately said, fuck it. You know, do, <laughs> do uh, made bot, like go down that path because you're clearly more passionate and you see a lot more potential in the long term for you even personally um, to do that. It's just, it sounds much more exciting. So, you know, I said, right, right. you're, you're totally right. And, um, that gave me the confidence to literally that night go for it and, um, actually start working on. It. So we started, we were part of an accelerator program and fast forwarding to get back to your question. Um, we, you know, made a lot of traction both on the customer development, but also the team and, uh, and even investor front, we got a lot of traction and interest there. And I reached a point where, we had an investor, or a few investors, uh, committed to investing a, a substantial amount of money, and then um, a few people. So I went to one of my mentors and said, "We need a CTO. We're going to fail as a company." And we actually found somebody who's a professor at Georgia Tech, um, who was willing to quit his job and move up to Ithaca, uh, tropical paradise, Ithaca, New York, <laughs> to join us time <laughs> and work on this. And it was just like kind of mind-blowing to me that that we had that and i knew it wasn't gonna last i knew that if we didn't act on it right away i might miss the opportunity forever potentially so um you know i went to my parents then and i said look we have people willing to give us literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in this plus people moving states or about to move states and quit their jobs very sustainable and, and safe jobs to join this i can't be the one saying hey, sorry, guys, I have to go to class now. I'll be back in a few hours. That's just not okay. So um, mm -hmm. that's when you know I really pushed up my parents and they became a lot more receptive to this idea of what's the worst case scenario? I go back to school. So you know, from that point forward, I said, look, I'm dropping out. This is my passion. I only have this time to do it. And they said, you know what? Do it. You're clearly really in love with it. And um, at that point, they've been like the most supportive parents ever. And I couldn't thank them enough. Uh, for all the support and just push they've you know put into me and just pushing me to the next level, I guess, in a sense, and uh, driving me forward. So, so that was back in uh, around August 2015. Um, and, you know, that was when we really hit the ground running. And when I left school, I was still in Ithaca, which was kind of weird because I had two lives. I was down in downtown Ithaca working on Maybot 14, 15 hours a day. Um, and then I had my friends up on campus. So, the rare occasion that I could go out one night, you know, for parties and whatnot, I hopped up there, hang, hung out with my friends, heard about all their exams and tests and homework and all that fun stuff. And then I would go back <laughs> there and like, you know, kind of be go out in the real world again and, uh, and be working on, on Madebot. So, so yeah, it was really back then when we hit the ground running and um, never looked back. And I don't know what the future holds necessarily in terms of education, but, um, but I know that I'm absolutely loving what I'm doing and I've learned way more in such a short period of time out in the real world than just throwing myself out there in the deep end, especially with relationships, I'd say, um, than I think I could have mm -hmm. in terms of just, you know, staying in class. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, man, I, I totally agree with that. And I'm just curious, you know, you're, you're mentioning that. So investors were, were wanting to throw hundreds and thousands at it and, and you had people wanting to leave steady, secure jobs to come and join the, the team. Um, wh at what point did you build MadeBot to be able to, to I guess, attract you know that kind of an, uh, attention with it? Did you have kind of a working prototype already at that point that you kind of just built your yourself? Or So, yeah, um, it depends how you define working. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we, we had something that was on the table i'll leave it at that uh lots of right. very ugly but it did move around um but that was <laughs> you know, somewhat of uh, the technology was definitely some of the progress but i think at that stage it was much more about um i guess two, the vision the, yeah exactly i was going to say the vision and the team at that point because um the fact that like we had this potential 
actual we had a lot of things lined up at least a lot, at least interest right with um some mm-hmm. major groups like the the huge marriott's and hilton's of the world um but then also you know we had this sense of a backing a the team is really the execution right so uh strategy is a commodity execution is an art and we needed artists so we had some and, and kind of those two together uh, and in fact our first investor said look i like i literally remember him saying um i bet on the jockey and you know this is this is the right jockey so it was a lot more around the team than i think anything else at that stage Gotcha. And then you just recently got accepted by the Teal Fellowship, correct? Yeah. Very excited and honored. Yeah, seriously, man. Yeah, congratulations. We've had a, a few of you guys on the show, actually, but that's that's a big deal. And so for, for people listening, can you just briefly explain that uh, for people that aren't familiar with it? Yeah. So Peter Teal is the co-founder of PayPal and the first outside investor in Facebook um, and made most of his success and, and money through Facebook. Um, and you know, right. investing 500000 when they're very early stage, uh, and obviously that being worth a lot more now. So anyway, Peter looked at that as, wait a minute, Mark Zuckerberg is not the only one um, dropping out of school or at least you know try, like, trying these new projects. So he created this foundation called the Teal Foundation, really built around empowering young entrepreneurs. Um, and the fellowship is a two-year fellowship where they give a $100,000 grant um, to 20 to 30 people uh, worldwide, but they have to be 22 or younger. And it's essentially to focus on your project. So, um, you know, different stages, different products, different projects, like completely everything from curing cancer to building Rosie the robot. But, um, but, you know, really it's around this idea that this is a true passion of what the person is doing. And you also get access to a really great community. So again, really honored to be a part of it and would highly recommend anyone um, who's interested and who's eligible, like under 22 to, or under 23 to apply and, and check it out for sure. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And so w- at this point, would you still consider MadeBot? It'd still be considered a startup, right? Yeah. So we're like just shifting into the company phase of like the revenues and building the team. But we do, in terms of number of people, if that's a metric, uh, we're up to 17. So very close to that company st- or small company, I should say, stage. So have you uh, made some sales already then or or gotten some contracts with various ho- hotels or um, and is is there a product that's actually like finished and, and working in the industry right now or Yeah so um, we move really quickly and and we do have some revenues they're small cuz it's just pilots but we do have a few paid pilots uh, one under our belt a few signed agreements with some huge groups like huge brands as well as huge ownership groups um, and we're right now, actually, we have units running around in a local property near us. Um, and we're getting a lot of feedback, a lot of validation, both on the uh, technical side, on the actual user experience side, and then the value prop side of, um, you know, are we providing the value we think we are? Uh, how do we quantify that? So. Interesting. So is there, is there, do you have a competitor in, in the space at all right now or anybody that's trying to come close? Do you know? So there are groups that have entered similar spaces, not really hotels as much. Um, we're looking to get outside of hotels as well eventually, but um, some groups are focused more of like cleaning in the malls, but no one really, I think, goes to our level of, uh, first of all, like the hospitality side, but also the idea of delivering a lot more value than just cleaning and just the productivity, just the reduction of injuries. So building out that data platform doesn't exist. So um, no one's really built an indoor mobile data platform this level before and when you say indoor mobile data platform can you explain that a little bit yeah for sure so we started off just robot cleaner fantastic and then started to get a lot of information Mm -hmm. from um from executives and others that there's really no good way or or sustainable way to uh, manage and look at some of these like stats uh within the building like some of the information being put at an objective level. So uh, that sounds a little abstract, but to get more practical, looking at things like environmental conditions, right? So yes, you have a thermostat on the wall and yes, you're detecting um, temperature up on the wall, but what about each square foot, right? And there's actually a lot of value in understanding how the buildings and how even the rooms themselves differ across different areas of it. 
Um, so we're looking at mm. using Rosie as this platform for embedding sensors. And we've already embedded a bunch, but looking at everything from temperature to humidity across the, you know, the entire building, all the way to Wi-Fi signal strength and uh, the dirtiest areas in a floor or in a, or in a room to understand where people are spending most of their time. So there's a ton of info, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so it's trying to figure out what do people really care about and, and what value is actually valuable versus just a cool, nice to have. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, I'm just trying to, as a, even a, a business owner of a, of a couple brick-and-mortar businesses myself, you know, being able to understand all of those kind of, uh, I guess, all, having all that info on each square foot of your building, I can definitely imagine would be some pretty valuable information. Uh, pretty valuable to you um out of curiosity what's what's kind of the so now that you guys are sort of you know you're definitely up and running and you're kind of trans starting to transition out of the startup phase and then more of the the company stage what's what's the day in a life of of micah green right now oh that's a good question um I mean, I know today you got your dog shaved and stuff, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mocha's looking great. Um, so big, uh, big accomplishment to that, but, um, a lot, I guess. And, and that's, you know, startup life with uh, even everyone on our team, I'd say, uh, wearing a lot of hats, but uh, I focus more on the business side. So we have a brilliant genius CTO who's amazing on the technology. So I'm, I'm involved, but more at the like management and process level, uh, than like the low level technical details. Um, so I help with that, help mm-hmm. with the actual like timeline and understanding problems and literally asking every day, um, what can I do to help? Who can I introduce you to? Like who, which advisors could be helpful for certain problems? Like really just seeing wh- even if I can't code and, and help with that front or, you know, on the hardware, like really helping deliver whatever value I can outside of that to the rest of the team. So I look at a big part of my job is just giving, providing resources to the rest of the um, even sometimes that's just grabbing pizza. Like it's, it could be anything like that, right? So mm-hmm. that's cultural too, making sure everyone's happy and uh, everyone joined our team because they love what they do specifically, but understanding ways to like have people step back and take a breather and, you know, have a party or stuff like that where um, it keeps people happy and, and engaged, but like, you know, sustainably engaged. Um, that's right. a, a big part for sure. But Outside of that, I deal a lot with like the investor side. So um, less so now, but I was previously working on fundraising and uh, building out those relationships, pitching, um, moving down the path with a few of those prospective investors, um, and then executing on that. So that's a big part. Uh, managing cash flow, so the budgeting, where are we spending our money, what should we not spend our money on, um, which you know mainly right now is a lot of um, actual hiring. So doing a lot of recruiting, interviews, sourcing of talent um so just literally had someone in today for a final interview for a sales position so um that went great Mm -hmm. so hopefully we'll be moving them forward um but really you know it it could be everything from recruiting to budgeting to um pr to building out that or getting interviewed uh, for things like this but also um other different things in hospitality so trade magazines that sort of stuff and um and then also looking at like the uh the family dynamic, which I look at our family as the team, but also our advisors, our mentors. So keeping everyone up to speed, getting advice, extracting value and, and information from people. Um, and finally, I'd say a huge part is just chief excitement officer, making sure everyone's excited. <laughs> um, I guess that's the high level for everything I just ranted about, but uh, attracting new investors, attracting new talent, keeping everyone excited and engaged. Um, and just, you know, overall, like, being the evangelist for everything we're doing and um, managing the pilot, managing relationships with hotels. So it's a lot of different stuff. And um, I mean, everything I listed today or right now, I probably worked on something for it today, Uh, but it's a lot of um, different kind of back and forth, which is fun. It keeps you on your toes and you're never working on the same thing for too long, which is nice. Right, because I'm trying to get at you know whenever you have a company that's that that's you know young but then starting to grow and your team starting to grow your product starting to get recognized um, you there's a lot of different hats you know to wear within the company and and you know where as at the start I imagine you were probably doing a lot 
more of maybe even some of the technical work and and uh, wearing a lot more hats as you start to grow and hire, especially hire more people, like say the sales rep, you you, you start to kind of settle into your your innate strengths more and, and delegate your weaknesses. And so I guess that's what I was I'm trying to get at is what you know what are Micah's uh, kind of innate innate strengths. And so would you not say that it's like coding or the the you know that they're you're hiring people that are even better at that than than you are i mean i imagine you did a lot of that in the early stages right oh yeah so um help yeah definitely at the early early stage help with that and uh definitely is weak uh, weakness so there are definitely areas i want to like improve on and kind of push myself out of my comfort zone so that can include some of the technical side of things and just exploring some of that um that can also include Mm -hmm. negotiating and, and like things that I mean, I had too much experience on. Um, and then on the the flip side, I guess, on the strengths, like specifically, you know, practically speaking, what I'm working on now, um, definitely more, more focused. I've actually been a lot more focused recently on culture, uh, building that out, maintaining it. So we went from last year, we had seven people on our team this month. Uh, this year, we have 17. So managing like yeah. that and how, you know, we we're really collaborative here, making sure that consistent the communication is there um as well as recruiting we've shifted a lot more to recruiting now that we've raised the money and uh moving down that path um and then a lot of the sales side so i love i love relationship building that's probably my favorite thing is just working with people and building relationships and um just overall having a good time and not taking life too seriously so um so that especially trickles into like signing agreements with hotel companies but also the pilots and, and managing those relationships, managing expectations. So those are like the specific things I'd say that today I focus on the most. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause I'm just trying to get like the majority of our listeners are between ages 16 and 25, you know, so they're young. A lot of them are, are, well, according to the last survey I did, most of them are interested in starting their own business at some point. And so I'm just trying to figure out, you know, I guess, I guess I could ask you just in your opinion, say somebody is listening, they want to start a company based around some sort of technology or maybe even robotics like maybe they really see a need for that but they're they don't have that much you know experience uh, with that do you think it's still possible to build a company around a strong vision maybe business plan and, and concept and they can gather the, the team around them and delegate maybe something that they're they're not as experienced in but still you know in order to push the whole thing forward oh yeah I- Absolutely. Like, um, again, not, not so technical personally. So the best, uh, thing was getting people that are experts in certain areas. Right. And, um, uh, there yeah. aren't necessarily experts in the future, I say. So sometimes it's good to also get people who aren't experts. So that could be students, people who just have a different perspective. Um, but surrounding mm-hmm. yourself with those that compliment you. So, I mean, that's how we started, right? We, we literally, the first thing I did that day that Pam, the, the mentor told me, fuck it, work on PayPot. We got a banner. We, uh, I actually had a friend make a logo in like 10 minutes because FedEx Kinko's was going to close. I was like, you got to do this, hurry <laughs> up, make it. He made it. So I was able to go to the career fair the next day. Um, and then I was there with our banner and, you know, just talking about, I didn't even know what at that point, <laughs> um, but we had a logo. So that was enough. Um, so you know, started <laughs> to just gauge and, and we knew we wanted to do robots for hotels. I didn't know much else at that point, to be honest. Um, did you even know that it was going to be like a like a vacuuming robot oh. for hotels? Did you know that much? No, least? I didn't know that. No, <laughs> I just knew it robots for hotels. So, so that's the stage we're at when we like started, and then um, the first step was finding building a team around us and building again, like you said, even like the idea of uh, surrounding yourself with like these people that um, you know really have that experience and can kind of fill the gap. So, um, so we went there. We luckily got one person from it. And she was amazing and actually attracted three other people who were on her project team in a class, um, just as interns for the summer, but still was really exciting. And that same period, um, there was a group that came up to us and his name was Alec. He ran this program called Rev, like a co-working space slash accelerator program. And they were starting this hardware accelerator to really you know, help hardware companies come about and, um, and pop up. So he came and we had a few interviews and, and started down that path. Um, so what was most helpful at that stage was again, surrounding myself with these, these people that kind of complimented me, especially on the technical side and then getting a resource, like an accelerator program that has mentors. And, 
Um, at that stage, and even now maybe, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I just find <laughs> mentors who do and then execute on what their good ideas are. Um, and, and, you know, the rest of our team's good ideas. But, um, but it was just constantly, constantly asking everybody for advice and then asking them for who, who I should talk to next. Um, and that was at the mentor level and the team level. So, um, just really that's, that's how things were able to sprawl about. And then I focused at that point more on like customer validation and just, uh, again, the excitement, the exciting people, perspective, and right. team members, that sort of stuff. So I, I feel like the average listener might hear a story like that and just say, at least based on, based on what you just said, like, Oh man, he you know he just got lucky. He was you know first of all probably you know in the in some of the right environments and already surrounded by the right people, and then just just happened to be like, oh, I'm interested in robots and them you know getting out of the assembly line. So robots in hotels, and then basically you, you that idea just seemed to to fly with people that knew more than you did, and so you just kept asking for advice and building from there. And so I'm curious, you know, did when when you say like you had this idea for robots for hotels and stuff was it like did you do um you know any kind of market research or due diligence to to be like okay even though i don't know what type of robot that would be exactly i just know that this industry really needs some some innovation there you know you see what i'm saying yeah and the the most helpful thing definitely did research um the most helpful thing i, I guess was actually throwing myself in the environment there's um, a lot, in, specifically in robotics, there are a ton of roboticists who are geniuses. They're building the coolest technology. But they're building technology. Mm-hmm. They're not building a solution because they don't have mm-hmm. problems being, that they need to solve. So um, what was most useful was just throwing myself in the deep end of being a housekeeper. And that's where I saw the issues that could be solved through robotics. And that's where I started looking at the applications. Um, and I totally, like looking back now at this story, it does sound like everything kind of came together out of thin air, which it kind of did, to be honest. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I, I, my advice, I guess, would just be that, um, especially in this tool setting, there's so many resources now with entrepreneurship too, it's growing tremendously. Um, we're just constantly going, first of all, exposing yourself to different things to search for problems and maybe you already have a problem you're looking to solve, but also just throwing yourself at new people. And I went to like literally every single... Uh, networking event I could. I went to all these uh, career fairs, pitch competitions, um, just all these cool things just to meet people and engage the um, environment. And uh, it was really being willing to ask for that advice and ask people I had no idea about and never met before um, where I could access some of these resources. And that's what led me to the career fair. That's what led me uh, to Rev. Um, and then that's what you know kind of brought some of this together. And it's a domino effect. Like once you meet Bob, Bob knows Susan and Susie and Jan and Joe and, you know, all these other people. So Mm -hmm. start actually getting connected to, it's like a, it's a huge network effect um, where now people start to hear about you, especially within the environment, the ecosystem, and they want to help or a lot, a lot of them do at least. Um, So again, constantly just asking for advice from everyone, from my professors to advisors to, um, to people in the entrepreneurship scene and just, that is, I think, what was so helpful in just getting our name out there so that people were joining the movement in a sense. Yeah, I, I love it, man. I'm just trying to get to, you know, the the root of how of of how maybe somebody listening could could replicate what, what you did. And and but, you know, the key thing that I think you said was that, you know, you actually got in the environment and worked in the environment and found problems yourself and then you were able to come up with solutions for that because at the end of the day entrepreneurship building great businesses and companies it's it's all about at least my in my humble opinion at the root of it it's it's solving problems yeah. it's it's building solutions and solving people's problems and you can't you know know what solution to build if you uh, don't know what the problem is and don't talk to people about it or don't experience it yourself and it reminds me of there's somebody I know who who built a very popular app uh, for an industry um, by he was familiar enough with the industry to know just a couple business owners within. And he basically just got them on the phone, uh, started interviewing them and talking to them. And he identified uh, several different pain points 
uh, that they were experiencing, narrowed that down to one kind of general problem they had, and then drew up uh, a simple design for an app that would basically uh, automate slash just make it a lot more efficient. Um, you know, did some preliminary designs for that app, took those designs to these people and said, here's the solution that I'm building for you. If, if I built this, would you buy it? They said yes. They gave him money up front even to buy it for various perks or not paying in the future when it was built. And they took that to some you know designer on uh, or uh, developer on Fiverr or some some freelance developer, built the thing, and, and he had a product. Right. And you know to me, to me it's that it, to me it sounds a lot similar to, to what you did, where you got to go out there and identify the problem. So that's I guess maybe what I'd tell people listening is. Uh, I feel like a lot of people sit around waiting for this these great business ideas and and the next cool technology, but it's like Micah didn't just sit around and and the idea for uh, robotics and hotels didn't just pop into his head. He actually had to work in the industry, experience and identify that problem, and then come up with what wasn't that specific of, of a solution yet. But you were on the right path to start to start with obviously yeah. robotics would solve a lot of issues that this industry is facing right now and then yeah then we're where we are today yeah, exactly and um i think one mindset that my mom at least really helped push into me and probably is like one of the best things that's helped me is knowing or admitting that everything is broken or everything could be improved mm-hmm. everything everything's a problem right. and as pessimistic or cynical as that might sound it's true like everything could be better this chair i'm looking at like this whiteboard I, you know there are ways to improve and, and their problem solutions create new problems and their solutions to fix those but those might create new problems right so there's this cycle uh mm-hmm. the goal is to minimize and, and increase solutions versus and decrease problems but um everything's broken so i think the key would be not like you said not just like waiting around and, and hoping like oh this the next facebook idea pops in your head or whatever but feeling the pain out there somewhere uh whether it's in hospitality or which could be hotels or restaurants or, you know, in the auto industry or in schools, right? Like people say the school system is complete. This is actually the Teal Fellowship is solving the problem of traditional education being broken. So it's Mm -hmm. what industry, what areas are, I guess, the most exciting and and get people the most interested. And then um, diving deeper within that. And then, like you said, starting to ask and poke around the questions and figure out what are the true pain points? What are the pains that uh, it, you know certain people might deal with? And there's so many of them, uh, but nailing down on one of those that you're addicted to solving. Um, and if you're not addicted to solving it, then everything gets, when all shit hits the fan, you'll be ready to, uh, to pack your suitcase and go. So. <laughs> Oh yes, yes, yes. Good, good stuff. Um, could you? Do you? Is there a particular maybe story that that sticks out in your mind when you think of your your worst entrepreneurial moment to date? I mean, I know, I know the company is still pretty new and stuff, but I imagine you gotta have a, a, you know, couple moments in there you'd consider to be the the worst so far. Yeah, only one moment. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a good one um, that we can talk about. Won't get too deep in the details, but sure. Uh, but this is early on, so um, this is actually really early on. So hopefully, it's applicable to a lot of people who want to start off. Um, so you know, we started in the accelerator program. We built out a team. We had we started with like four Cornell students that went up to I think we got seven or eight people uh, helping out early on, just as kind of like part time interns and whatnot. And it was really exciting. And they were they getting it. paid at this point, or were you paying anybody at this point, or no? So um, actually, that's where the story headed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> continue. Um, so you know, the way I pitched it was, look, there's this problem. I really want to solve it. We can solve it in a really cool, completely revolutionary way using robotics. And you love robots, so work with me to build really cool robots that actually solve real world problems. <laughs> and we'll take it from there. We'll see what happens. Worst case, we go back to school, you know, work on something else. Uh, best case, let's see what, you never know, right? Where, where could this go? So that's how I pitched it. And it's because I, I didn't even know, I didn't know I was going to drop out of school. I didn't know I was going to ask, like, seek funding. I, I had no idea where this was going. I thought it would be a cool summer project. So um, 
so really it was fantastic. Everything was going great. And I was just loving life. And, you know, I had all these meetings. I was talking to these cool executives at hotels. I was managing some of the tech side at the high level and, you know, seeing things come together and seeing robots work and working with 3D printers for the first time at scale. And it was just really exciting stuff. And, um, and all of a sudden, I get into the office, and the team's not there. And I say, "Oh, okay, they're going, they're going on a nice walk. This is so fun. Like <laughs> the team is so close already that they're doing a team stroll together. I wish they invited me, but that's cool. Uh, at least they're comfortable to, you know, go on their own." <laughs> uh, little did I know they were not going on a team walk. Um, I actually reached out to somebody and I said, "Hey, like, where where are you guys? Are you guys going for a walk? Are you getting breakfast? Like, what, what's going on?" And then I got a text back and he said, no one's coming back into the office until we have agreements on the table. And I said, what? <laughs> what, what, what is going on here? <laughs> so they went on strike. So literally everyone went on strike. And here we were, we didn't even have like a freaking wheel put together. Like, why are we going on strike, guys? Like, what, what's going on? And, um, and you know, I, I was very concerned instantly. I actually started getting really nervous about like, did I say something? Am I doing like... You know, usually I feel like I'm pretty uh, mature and not you know, too too out there, raunchy about whatever I say or do. And right. um, I, I was scared I did something or whatever, or something. Yeah, I don't know. But ultimately, it was the fact exactly like what you asked about, and it was the fact that we didn't have any firm agreements signed, and right. things were actually progressing pretty well. So I, I exaggerated. We did have a few wheels put together. Like we. We had a robot. We had some traction. We actually had interest from investors, and um, uh, pretty early on from that point. But still, like it wasn't. It was so early that I just didn't think it was necessary. I didn't know where this thing was going. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was far enough along, at least, that the team didn't want to continue until we had something in place. Because if this blew up, they'd get screwed. You know, I'd be this huge billionaire, whatever, and that uh, like that's what they've envisioned. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so. <laughs> You know, that, I, I literally ran to our lawyers. <laughs> like, I literally printed over there from the office and um, went into the office. And I, I walked into the lawyer's office who was meeting with someone. I'm like, nope, sorry, dude, you got to go. I'm, I need to meet with him now. <laughs> and <laughs> sat down with the lawyer and said, we need an agreement before I leave this room right now. Like, I need to get this. I can't. I'm freaking out. This is all going to go to shit. I don't want to get sued. I want to build a great company. That's my goal. My goal is not to screw anyone. It's not to screw myself. Um, so we did it. They put together a consulting agreement and we essentially went back and we said, look, if we raise X number of funding, I think it was like 150 or 200,000, then each person would get X, Y, and Z. Like we'd have kind of a number for each person specifically. So that way, if we didn't raise money, I'm fine. But if we did raise money, they feel like they got rewarded, which is good. I, I wanted that. I didn't want to screw anybody. Yeah. Um, but I just thought it was too early to even talk about money. But apparently not. So, um, so yeah, that was my big like slap in the face moment was, you know, this is a company. And this affects people's lives, their livelihoods sometimes. Uh, maybe not these students, but, you know, full-time people for sure. And you have to put these things in place. And you always need to put these expectations up front, whether it's compensation or something completely different, but like yeah. putting those up front and being transparent. Th that's like what taught me like straight up transparency. Like, no, not that I was hiding anything, but like be way over the top in terms of up front. So if I didn't, if I was never going to pay them, say that, make it so clear that the people pay people to not be there. Like I know mm -hmm. companies that pay you if you leave uh, within like a month of starting or something, you know, because they don't want people who are incentivized by the money. Um, so yeah, that was a big wake up call. And luckily we got it back. We got everyone together. You know, I, I apologized for it, but at the same time said, you guys like not cool to just go on strike. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but, but it was solved and, um, that was it. I, I think the big lesson was again, being transparent and making sure you have things down in writing because it's not when everything's going great that people will push back or have issues. It's when shit hits the fan that everyone starts getting, or when things go so great that right. it's like, wait a minute, I want a piece of this. Uh, so it's more of the extremes. But that was like a big, like, kind of shifting point to me mentally of how do you really work with people and, and how do you set things up at the beginning? Yeah, seriously, man. And yeah, I imagine that was quite the wake up call. And uh, I, I can completely agree. We've had 
you know, some, some businesses and, and things start out pretty informal with, you know, partnerships and, and ownership and, um, equity and stuff like that. And by the time it gets to be, uh, a, a decent business, uh, actually bringing in some, some revenue and generating some profit, then you, you definitely wish that you have got, you know, things were clearer, um, laid out in writing, agreed upon, uh, right, right at the start. And, uh, yes. luckily we've, we've always been saved because of the, the relationships we've had with our business partners and stuff. Um, and right. at the end of the day, that's really what it, that's really what it comes down to. But, uh, man, nothing, nothing like, a growing business or even a dying business and money and, and, uh, risk can, and stuff can, uh, nothing, nothing can tear apart a relationship faster than that. So. Yeah. And I think actually the money part was like the big wake up call too. I think money drives people in very interesting ways. And, um, you know, for me, for example, I give zero shits about money at that time and still do really like, it's not, it's not really a motivator. Um, it's more of like a potential side effect, but, some people look at it as a motivator and um, yeah, just on the, that was the other side is like really understanding what truly motivates people. Cause I thought at the time it was changing the world and bringing robots to the housekeepers and bringing robots to the real world. Um, and apparently not necessarily the case. So, so yeah, definitely good. And, um, mm-hmm. and especially the students that like uh, the other side was that like the, everyone else was a student as well. So they're less experienced in the real world and has some of this work. So um, so I think we all kind of fell into that trap a little bit and now, uh, I don't think, I hope none of us do it again. <laughs> so. Right. Right. Well, and you said something key there, or at least, you know, you were saying your big motivation was you, you wanted to change the world. It sounded like, it sounds like it was really work that you loved. Um, and you, you weren't in it from the money from the start. And for, I, I guess for anybody listening, that's sure something I've, I've found out personally. And so I'd, I'd, as well. And so I would encourage you if you are, you know, in the early stages of a, of a startup or a small business or thinking about it, it's, I, I would be careful about starting anything or committing to something just for the money, at least in the beginning. Um, at, at least every time I've tried to do that, it's, it usually doesn't end up too well. And typically what happens is I'll get burnt out. Um, and so it's really find work that, that you love, find a vision that you can really, um, that really just gets you out of bed in the morning, um, kind of raring to go. And typically you'll find that the money comes as a result of that, as I'm sure is, you know, that's what's happening, uh, you know, with, with Micah and his vision right now. But anyways, man, we're, we're getting down to the end of our time here. I've got two, two more questions that I like to ask every guest on the show. And, uh, the first one is, do you have any parting advice for any of our listeners who are thinking of dropping out, say to pursue a business venture or an idea like you did, but they haven't quite made that step yet. Any parting advice for those people? Yeah. So, um, I mean, going back to actually the point you've uh, been hitting on a lot, which I think is so, so important is this idea that you really should like money is a commodity. I think that's less of the point more is the point of like passion is not. And what you love in the world is like, something that you can control and have the ability and, and especially in the U S have a lot of freedom to actually execute on. Yeah. Um, finding what you are st- truly passionate about can be really hard and, um, it, it takes a while and sometimes it takes lifetime, but really trying to nail that down and, and get that feeling and that gut reaction to, Oh my gosh, this is incredible. And whether that's robotics or VR or, uh, marketing or podcasts or whatever it might be. Um, that's the key and the rest kind of will i don't want to say will fall into place i mean you have to work for it but um but that's the key and and really locking down what what areas do you want to focus on and whether it's just one or multiple um and then just hitting the ground running like crazy and putting everything into it because although it might seem like you know going to that party that one night is will be fun it's the sacrifices that ultimately bring you forward and and give you that leverage over some other people. And you're not going to make those sacrifices for something you only kind of care about. Um, so, so yeah, I would say just locking down on, on what you love and what you uh, eat, sleep and breathe. And uh, that will unlock a whole lot of happiness and also just uh, drive to, to execute on it. And um, you won't feel trapped. You won't feel forced to do anything. You'll feel empowered and 
free. And now you mentioned uh, kind of finding, you know, what you love and what you, you know, eat and, and breathe and what you're passionate about for people where that the, that might not be so apparent. I mean, what what advice do you have? Do you think it's maybe just a matter of some for somebody that say they're just graduating high school right now and it's not quite clear, uh, maybe they they just need to try a bunch of different stuff, throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks or or you know, what's your take on that? Exactly. Exactly that. I mean, yeah. there's Coursera, so you can start taking classes online. There, you know, with Udacity, Coursera, those. Um, there's a bunch of events in a lot of areas, whether in New York City or uh, Alabama. Like, you could find some cool events. Um, <laughs> I think exposing yourself to things that you never maybe would have thought you would try, or even just exposing yourself to a bunch of things that you always wanted to try. Um, I think the key is like looking at it as tomorrow is just an invention. Tomorrow is a decoy. And there's only really now. And there only will ever be now. And you could say that you're going to do this one thing or try this one thing when you're 20 or when you're in college or what, you know, but that's not going to happen. You have to do it now. So, you know, it could be everything like all over the map. But for me, it was trying things like music producing. I loved music and, and going to concerts, but I just wanted to play with it and try. And I didn't really know how to make music or even play any instruments at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I tried. And then you know, that could be everything from there to the robot side. And, and you know, it, it's all over the place. But I think a lot of people um, get the most innovative when they start connecting dots. And when you can start pulling a lot of pieces together and start looking from different p perspectives and viewpoints and um, trying all that. So, yes, exactly what you said. Throw things at the wall. Things won't stick. You're going to hate stuff. And that's great because at least you know you hate it. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> throw about. But there's going to be that one or three or two, whatever, however many things that you do absolutely like can't live without. Um, and that's going to make it all worth it in the end. So it might take a while, but um, but you'll find it. Yeah. Love it. Um, last question here, man. What, what parting advice do you have for any of our listeners who uh, have already dropped out and who are already on their, their entrepreneurial journey, maybe about where you are? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's this amazing poem called If. Have you ever read that? Oh, uh, it's familiar, but I couldn't, I couldn't recall it though right now. Yeah, so really good. Um, and it basically, it's If because it like, there, it's kind of two forks in the road. Like you can look at, it's all about perspective. And there's this one line in there, and I don't want to butcher it, so I'll just paraphrase. But it talks about this idea of treating the two imposters the same. And I think the way they describe it is, you can be a peasant down in the dumps, in the scraps, looking for trash, or you could be a king ruling a kingdom. But either way, you need to keep your head level, uh, be humble, but also like, you know, be regardless of if today is the worst day of your life or this morning. Because one thing I've learned too is, people say entrepreneurship is a roller coaster ride. Sure, that's true, but it's not over the course of a day or a week over the course of an hour <laughs> you might have one hour where you just heard the worst news ever and then the next hour where you just you know got a commitment for a huge investment or a deal signed or whatever right yeah, and it's right. constantly up and down and you having that get to your head can be really really disruptive so um for me what i find is just taking a step back looking both at the positive and negatives and really being able to do that through meditation um to just acknowledge your thoughts and where, where your head's at, but don't take anything, I guess, too seriously. So don't get too excited about the positives and don't get too in the dumps about the negatives. And if you're able to maintain that, you slowly start turning into a robot, but it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a robot, but like you, you're able to just, you're thin or your skin thick and you're able to take a lot more yeah. and the just goes way up and not many people at all have, have the ability to like, embraced a lot of just downside and upside in, in such a short period of time so i'd say just meditate has been meditation has been super helpful for me practically speaking um and just making sure that you never take either the great news or the bad news way too seriously yeah yeah you're just more more even keeled and i i pulled that uh that poem up and i i do remember it now it's such a such so good it's too long to read right now but i'll uh, link to that <laughs> in the show notes, guys, it's a great suggestion. Um, Micah, what's the best way for people to connect with you? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm on Facebook for sure. And I'd probably say the best is actually email because I check it like OCD. So <laughs> Micah at madebot.co and you have my email. So you feel free to post that as well. Perfect. Well, successful dropouts, you are the average of the five people you hang around the most and you've been hanging out with Micah and Kylan, learning what it takes to drop out, grind and succeed. For everything we talked about today, head over to SuccessfulDropout.com and type Micah into the search bar and the show notes will pop right up. And as always, stay hungry, stay foolish. For more information about how to drop out, grind, and succeed, go to SuccessfulDropout.com. I also love questions. If you have a question about anything we talked about today, I want to hear from you. Go to SuccessfulDropout.com and click the Ask Me a Question link at the top of the page. Successful Dropouts, if you could go to iTunes and leave a positive rating and review, it would help this show out a lot. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot going on. But if you do that, it helps this podcast rank. It helps other people listen to it and gain value just like you have been. Thank you so much in advance.